morning's theme is faith and works. Turn to your neighbor and say, faith and works. Faith and works. We're kind of in a, a series of, of a year called Seize the Opportunity. And it kind of coincides with this text because this text will challenge us about our faith, how we believe, and what we do in our faith. Amen. James chapter 2. Verses 14 through 19. Say amen when you have it. It says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Let's pray. Father, again, uh, we are so grateful, Lord Jesus grateful, Lord Jesus, to be uh, hospitable to all the brethren that have come from near and far. We are the host church, Lord, and, and we were so privileged, Lord Jesus, to host this rich uh, event called the convention. Father, we are now weeks away from that convention, and we are enriched because of it. We are inspired. We were challenged, Lord Jesus. But mostly we are encouraged by all your speakers, Lord. We are better because of it, Lord. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that was that was so evident, Lord Jesus, in all of our services. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for prompting your spirit within us. Again, bless this time, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Lord Jesus, as you hide me behind your precious cross, Lord, and impart your truths, that you would truly teach us what it is to have faith and works. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody says, Amen. Amen. Again, I told you this would be challenging as far as this teaching, for myself included. And the reason for that is because James comes at us in a manner that kind of, kind of makes us look at ourselves when it comes to our belief in Christ Jesus. What he says about works, again, there are a lot of doctrines out there, teachings out there, that believe that salvation is not only about Jesus Christ being the gift of God, but in order for you to be saved, that you must do things to maintain that salvation. Let me say that again. There are a lot of teachings out there that believe solely that, yes, you can believe that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, but that is not enough. That you must do other things to maintain your salvation. I'm going to go here. It says, faith plus. If someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, a good question mark by James, so what does James mean by that? And you'll see there, there's a cross with a plus sign. And that's what I mean about these teachings that are out there. There are teachings out there that says that what Jesus Christ did on the cross at Calvary was not enough. There are teachings out there that believe that what Jesus Christ did for your sins and mine did not cover your sins. There are teachings out there that say, unless you continue to do various tasks, you aren't saved. That you physically, in your, in your humanity, must continue to be disciplined and continue to do these things. And when I say these things, whatever these teachings are, that you maintain your salvation. And that's why I put that up there, because James says, if someone claims to have faith but does not have deeds, does not have works, that means that they are not saved. 
I'm going to go to some text real quick and I'm going to come back to this. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, again, this is part of our, our teaching when we come to salvation. It is our faith. We come to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. We come to believe that God of all creation came to set man free. We believe that he sent his only begotten son so that all of us that come to believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior, we are saved. It is faith. And of course, there is a faith, a continual faith. You need to understand. There's saving faith. And there's a faith that gets us through life. And I'll go into that a little later. That saving faith is a one-time thing. Let me say this again so you grab it. That saving faith is a one-time task. What Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago, he said that he had the power, the power, his resurrection power, to overcome for many of us, we feel whatever the things that you've got entangled with in life. Some of us have gone through life and life has not been fair. Maybe we didn't have a mom, maybe we didn't have a dad. Maybe we were raised in an environment that was, was a, a evil and because of that environment, we got caught up in various things. Maybe we got caught up in the 70s. Maybe we, we were uh, children of divorce. Maybe. Our parents were very abusive. Maybe there was a family member that was abusive. Maybe you got involved in some kind of criminal activity. No matter what the situation was, somehow we were raised in an environment or some uh, way life has handed us a, 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 an issue in life where we, for some apparent reason, fell into that trap. It didn't end there. It didn't end there. But God came into our lives. And because God came into our lives, we saw that our lives weren't, wasn't measuring up to what we wanted in life. And God came into our life. How did he come into our life? He either came into our life because somebody invited us to meet the Savior. Maybe you heard about the Savior through, whether it was TV or radio. Maybe you read about it. Maybe it was some small voice, somehow, some way, Jesus Christ was um, uh, introduced to you and of course that's where that prompting came you said I don't like the way my life is going so you accepted Jesus Christ into your life and because of that you are forever changed Amen. you are now the Bible says if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation and so when we think about that life that is the life that we hope for Jesus Christ came into our life have we ever seen Jesus Christ no we have never seen Jesus Christ, but we have seen what Jesus Christ has done for us in our lives. Amen? Amen. So this is Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to go to a text I think that many of us don't really look at, but I think it's important to look at. It says, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. That should be a dash between the, uh, the 8 and the 1 and the 0. It says, by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Turn to your name and say, it is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. It's a wonderful gift. I mean, we celebrate this gift and we acknowledge this gift and we come to believe in this gift during Christmas time. We call it Emmanuel, God with us. And see, isn't it wonderful that God, the God the Father sent his only son into the world and we celebrate Christmas and we call this Emmanuel, God with us. An incredible time where all the angels came and we hear glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to all to men. I mean, we think about this and we say, this is Emmanuel, but God didn't stop there. God became through the power of Pentecost. God came into our lives. No longer is God with us. Don't get me wrong. God with us. He walked with the disciples and the people of that time. God with them. Incredible. But he didn't stop there. He became God in us. Hear this church. He became God in us. 
And so because he's God in us, it is the Holy Spirit in us that enables us, that empowers us, that testifies to God's truth, that helps us get through life because greater is he that it is in us. Amen. Amen. So it says in verse 9, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So, in other words, going back to that, that one uh, point that I wanted to point out to you. We did not get saved by anything that we did. We can't maintain or do anything else to add to our salvation. We, you need to understand this, because to me, when anybody tells you, you have to do this, you have to do uh, little trivial things. We, we usually say that, well, if you don't read your Bible, you're not saved. If you don't pray, you're not saved. If you don't go to church, you're not saved. If you don't fast for 40 days and 40 nights, you're not saved. I mean, we go on. If you don't go and witness, you're not saved. Don't get me wrong. Those are, I'll talk about those later. Those are spiritual disciplines. But those things don't make you saved. If you don't get baptized, you're not saved. There are a lot of people that teach that you have to have a plus sign next to the cross because what Jesus Christ did on Calvary is not enough. And sometimes we kind of, sometimes we kind of add that to ourselves. What do I mean by that? The devil kind of whispers in our ears. Because when we think about salvation, it was a gift. We never received. You know, we didn't gain that gift by ourselves. Jesus gave it to us. He came into our lives. He didn't tell you, well, think about this, the old adage. When you invite your friends to church, they usually say, well, I don't really want to go to church because i got to get my life together. Isn't that wonderful that God says you don't have to get your life together, just come as you are? Amen. Isn't that wonderful that God loves us by his grace? His grace to accept us the way we are. I love this part. That's why when we think about uh, faith plus this verse, it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. I'm going to go ahead because I want you guys to see this. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in other words, we are saved by grace, through faith. And God created us through faith to do good works. Not to receive salvation, not to maintain salvation, but created to do good works. And that's the thing that we need to differentiate on. I was saved by something, by being an all-powerful God. Nothing that I could do, but I just came to believe that Jesus Christ was my Savior. I'm going to end with this. I'm going to give a, a little uh, plug for a Bible study. John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world, and if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, in your Bible, in your Bible, if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, please do so. If you don't have this memorized in your heart, please do so. Okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the verse that to me should transform lives. Amen. It should remind us about God's gift. Jesus Christ, it says, and you can make this very intimate, for God so loved, and put your name there. You can say, don't, 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 don't make it so broad and say the world. Put your name there. It is that intimate that God so loved them that he gave his only son that if Ben believes in him, should not, that I will not perish, but have everlasting life.
and it should remind us that God loves us so much. Again, the devil has a tendency to bring to our minds and whisper to us, remember when you used to do this? Remember how you used to live? And maybe even now, now that you're in Christ Jesus, the devil even comes to speak to us and say, you call yourself a Christian and look at your thoughts. Look what you did to your husband the other day. Look what you said to your friend the other day. You call yourself a Christian? At the same time, that's where you as Christians need to remind the devil and finish the statement that it is through God's shed blood on Calvary. We celebrate this every first Sunday of the month. That's why it's a reminder. We memorialize his death. It is through his shed blood on Calvary that I am forgiven of my sins. Amen. Again, there's that old Bible, I mean that Bible, that bumper sticker. It says Christians are not perfect. Just forgiven. Amen. <laughs> Just forgiven. Right on. And it's a, it's a wonderful reminder of all of us. We are still living in this world, but we're not of this world, but we are covered by God's shed blood. Amen? Amen. So when God the Father ever comes and he ever looks at us, he didn't see Pastor Ben and all of his imperfections. He said he sees his son, Jesus Christ, shed blood on my life. Amen? I've done you. I'm going to tackle this next one. Faith with works. Not faith and works, but faith with works. It says, verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So what does that mean? What is James trying to say? I know he says faith and works, but we know that faith and works literally are partners. And that's what Paul, and that's what James is trying to teach us this morning. Faith with works. They literally partner with one another. And what do I mean by that? There's a pastor, his last name is Wright, and he says, as you're walking, your left leg is your faith. Your right leg is your works. And of course, as you're stepping, you go, faith, works, faith, works, faith, works. And now as you begin to walk, after a while, they literally go, hand in hand, and you're no longer saying faith works because they literally intertwine. And that's what he's talking about. That's what James is talking about when he talks about faith with works. They are partners together. And it's because of what Jesus did for us on Calvary. What does this mean? Does it mean that I have to work out my faith? And again, as I alluded to, it's not about a salvation thing. It has to do with an inner transformation that took place in your life when Jesus Christ came into your life. It has to do with when you have accepted Jesus Christ in your life, there is a fruit that comes from that. The Bible tells us you will know them by their love. You will know them by their fruit. And we know that we are disciples because of the fruit that comes from us, from the love of Jesus. And sometimes there is, because of the faith that we have in Christ Jesus, it manifests this, this fruit. It kind of shows itself out from our love from Jesus. And one of the things that I want to talk about is spiritual discipline. When you become a a believer in Jesus Christ, I shouldn't have to tell you, or I should not have to force you to be part of a Bible study. You should hunger and desire for God's righteousness. You should be hungry for God's word. You should be one of those individuals that says, I can't get enough of my God. And so, the Bible tells us that one of these disciplines is Bible study. When you become a new believer, you want to know more about God. And I equate this to, you see somebody, and you're a male, 
And you see this wonderful looking sister that's there. And when you see this wonderful looking sister, and for those sisters out there, you see a nice looking guy, and you see him out there. And one of the things you want to do is you want to literally engage and converse with this person. But because you have an interest in that person, what do you generally want to do? You want to talk with them. You want to get to know them. You want to converse with them. And you want to go where they go, be where they are. And it's the same way. When you come to know who Jesus Christ is, you want to go and be with them and talk to them. And one of the ways we get to know Jesus is through Bible study. Bible study is where the, the new believer literally gets his roots. Because it's where you can ask the questions. You know, why did Noah do what he did? Why did Moses, why did, you know, you can ask all these real crazy questions. I mean, being a brand new believer, I remember asking all these questions. Was it really big? How come the animals didn't kill each other in this, in this big old... You ever ask those questions? Right? I mean, if I'm a lion and I'm in this big old ark, right? And I see something like a deer, well, it's going to look delicious to me. Right? Don't you ask those questions? I mean, I know we spiritualize things and we figure, okay, but come on. You're a lion. I'm supposed to eat you. Right? But we know that God had everything under control, and we generally will say that, right? But do you ever ask those questions? You know, I mean, these are good questions, right? All these stories of the Bible, and we ask, you know, you know, why didn't this person do what they should have done? And that's part of Bible study, asking your Bible. Again, please don't go to your Bible studies and just kind of ask the question to stump your facilitator. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I know we do that. And that's a good thing to challenge the, your, your facilitator. But let's go there so that we can build each other up. In other words, ask those questions. But it's Bible study is where we get the roots that go down deep. Because we can ask those questions that you can't generally ask during a morning service. And that's why I encourage you. It says... For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Bible study. I want to grow in Bible study because it's a spiritual discipline. Prayer. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. Another spiritual discipline. That is my communion with my Abba Father. If you tell me you've been a Christian for about five years and you don't know how to pray yet, you're still a baby then. I mean, by that time, you should be beyond the model prayer, our Father who art in heaven. You know, that's just, that is not a prayer that we recite saying that that's the prayer that I'm going to have every single minute, every single day every single year. <clears throat> Think about this. If I came to you and I talked to you and I said the same thing over and over. In other words, we never grow to know each other. And that's how you know in your prayer life how much you've grown with God the Father. What is your prayer life like? And we can see that when I invite you to pray. Some of us, well, I don't really want to pray because I'm embarrassed. Embarrassed of what? That's your Father, God. You know, I mean, some people are afraid to pray, but I'm trying to figure out why. You know, are you afraid to say grace in front of people? Why? I ask that question. That is a spiritual discipline. I'll move on. Church attendance. Some people think, and I've been, to, I've been told this, well, because of media, I don't really have to come to church. Church is part of the spiritual discipline. And it's biblical. And you think about this. If you remember my, my series on membership has its privileges, well, let me take it to another level. 
we know that in Corinthians 12, it talks about the being part of the body. Well, this is what I mean, church is biblical, because God created the church in the book of Acts. But I believe this. There are people that actually say, I don't need to belong to a organized church. I don't need to be there because I could go online and listen to the word, and so I'm, I'm good. That's the devil. That's the devil speaking because it has to do with this, and this is what I mean by it being biblical. To be part of the body of Christ is to be part of the church. If Jesus Christ is the head of the church and we are the body, if you're not belonging to a body, you are disconnected from the body of Christ. God created the church so that we could be together. We are not supposed to be solo or, or lone Christians out into a world to face life by itself. We are to be together. Amen. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembly of yourself as some are in the habit of doing. We know that, that there are Christians out there that choose not to be part of a church. But they're out of the will of God. It's important for you to be your wife. Because we have potlucks. <laughs> Some people, we laugh at that, but to be honest with you, think about what potlucks do. They, they, they bring great cheer, right? Great joy. They bring, it brings unity, right? It brings unity, right? Let's say there, there I know some people may not financially have it all together. And what I mean by that, maybe they're living check to check. And if you are having a potluck, they don't have to provide lunch for their family. And you, you need to, some of us don't think this way because we're already thinking about the restaurant we're going to eat at in a little bit, right? But there are some families that have financial hardship. And so when you are a church or a Bible study that has little food, they don't have to prepare for their families. And we don't think along those lines, but that's what it was all about. In the, in the letter to Paul to the Corinthians, they had potlucks. But the rich people would say, our food over here is for us. You poor people, you're on the other side. You're not invited to share with our porterhouse and our tri-tip. You get to eat your food over there. Crackers, cheese whiz, <clears throat> cup of noodle, <clears throat> okay? But potlucks bring the body of Christ together. It edifies us. It strengthens us. It builds community. And that's just one thing of many things why we are together. It also brings a spiritual support. The Bible tells us when one hurts, we all hurt. Amen. But when one rejoices, we all rejoice. Amen. The, the church is probably the greatest institution God ever created. Because we're all these individuals, and I call it this diversity, we're all different, different personalities, different likes and dislikes, different opinions, different talents, different abilities, but God has brought us all together so that we can strengthen one another and so that the body, being together, can be an immovable force. And that's why we're together. So there are people out there that don't believe in church attendance. And I believe that if they are not connected with the body, they're literally on their own and they're out of the will of God. Because they need to be part of the body of Christ. You know, we're, we're intertwined together. And that's what, that's what makes us formidable. We are together. And I know that again, we need to pray for people that are out there that for some apparent reason don't come to church. I've asked, I was asked by an individual that had not come to church in a long while, 
And these bad things started happening to them. Bad things. And they asked me, go, hey, Pastor, do you believe that God is doing these things to me? You know? They asked me that. And I said, well, let me put it this way. You told God, come into my life, be Lord and Savior. Now think about God. And his, the teaching of perseverance. You have not come to church in a long time. And all of a sudden, I, I don't really need to know why you haven't come to church, but you haven't come to church. And he asked me this question, did God allow all these things to happen to me? And I go, well, God is a sovereign God, meaning he's in control of all things. But we also know we live in a very evil world. Now, because you're his child and you have not done what he wants you to do because God has got a character. He wants to groom us. He wants us to be like him. Being away from church, to me, tells us that I don't want anything to do with God. That's harsh, right? But that's the reality of it. God's people are here. Where two or three are gathered, in his, he's in our midst. Where God is, there is change. His word is professed here. I get stronger as I'm with God and God's people. When you're away from God or God's people, you grow weaker and weaker and weaker. And that's not what God's will is for your life. So this brother asked me, so you didn't answer my question. <laughs> and I told him, because we live in a very evil world, bad things happen to good people as well as bad people. But because you're a child of the king, I believe that God allows things to come into our life. Now it's a matter of perspective. How do you receive that? Are you going with your fist against God and saying, why are you allowing this? Or are you saying, you know what? These bad things have been happening quite too frequently. And maybe God is trying to tell me something. And this big old light should come on. And it should be the Holy Spirit speaking to you. You need to go back to church. Now I'm not going to say that bad things won't happen to you when you come to church. But you'll have a godly perspective. You'll know that these things may be happening. But God is in control. Again, it's a, it's a, a wonderful thing when you would think about perspective. Amen? I hope I said that word correctly. We move on. Faith with works. And they literally go hand in hand. Amen? Faith alive. You know, I, I wanted to think of faith continually. That's too wordy. So it's faith lived out. So I figure I'd steal that word alive. You believe that there's one God. Good. Explanation point. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So what is James saying here? He's actually telling us that the devil believes there's a God. So what does that mean about us? Well, I believe in God. But I don't do any of the disciplines. I don't fast. I don't go to Bible study. I don't go to church. I don't pray. I don't give. What does that tell you? Think about that. The devil and his demons believe there's a God. They don't go to church. They don't read his Bible. They don't pray. They don't give. Who am I mirroring? Who am I mirroring? I mean, you got to figure. You're either with God or against God. And you may have given a profession of faith saying that I believe that Jesus Christ is God. But if you're not doing the spiritual disciplines of God, then, of course, I have to question, are you in Christ Jesus? Because there are a lot of people, again, so that you understand this, I'm not trying to question whether or not you're saved. I question you because a lot of people have gone to Billy Graham Crusades. Tens of thousands have come to the altar because Billy Graham has said, come, come. And the masses come down. But well, why did they come down? 
Do they come down to say, oh, that's what he looks like? <laughs> or do they come down with the hands extended to heaven, telling God, your word was for me. And whatever your servant said, I received Jesus Christ into my life. I no longer want to live the way I used to live. But Jesus, come in my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Make me a new creation. If that is the person they are, believe me, that genuine profession of faith will have, been, will have transforming power. Let me say that again. Because of that genuine profession of faith, that faith will have transforming power. There are a lot of people that say they're Christians, but they don't want anything to do with the church. There's a lot of people that say they're Christians, but won't want to read God's word. There are a lot of people that say they're Christians, but have not said one little prayer to their Alma Father. i got to question that. Faith the life. Even the demons believe there's a God. And they shudder. And in our passage, I want to share this with you. It has to do with Abraham, verse 21. We know that Abraham, he was made righteous because he was willing to offer his son Isaac on the altar. And we see that his faith and his actions were working together, as I, I spoke about. But what did he do? In the book of Genesis, chapter 22, there's a story about Abraham. And of course, Abraham was told of God, and Abraham was like a foreshadow of Jesus. What does that mean? We know that God the Father had to offer up Jesus as his only begotten son. Abraham prayed for a son, and eventually he was supposed to be called the father of many nations. God finally blesses Abraham with the son Isaac. And then, of course, God told Abraham, because this was the test, will Abraham trust God? So God told Abraham to take your son and some wood and go up to Mount. And they were going to go up there because his instructions was to kill his only son, Isaac. Think about some of the thoughts in this part of Bible study again. Why would God, after he, I cried and prayed for a son, and God told me I would be the father of many nations, this is my only son, Isaac, and you're going to take him from me? Do you ever think about that? I'm going to read this passage with you. It says, early, birth of chapter 22. It says, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac, and when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, that burnt offering was for his son Isaac, he set out for the place God had told him about. Verse 4, on the third day Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. That's where he's going to sacrifice Isaac. We will worship then we will come back to you. You didn't catch that. We will come back. Abraham trust wholly in God, solely in God, that he knew somehow, some way, God would provide. And that is the most powerful thing in this passage when God, when Abraham says, my son and I will go up even though he knows that God says you're going to sacrifice your son Isaac on the altar, Abraham believed God. Abraham had faith in God that God would provide. And he says those, that statement, we will go to worship, then we will come back. That was Abraham's. And that's why Abraham is in the Hall of Fame. <clears throat> Rahab is also listed in this text. And we know that Rahab, she was a harlot, as the Bible tells us, and she was justified by her works. She received also a message from these messengers. And Rahab is also an individual we think about and say, well, what did she do? 
Well, Rahab had a personal belief herself, but she believed in the God of Israel. And she had heard about the God of Israel and all of what he did for his people. And she came to embrace that God of Israel. And we know there's a story about um, Rahab, and I've asked this question many times in my youth, or even today. Do you know what Rahab did that we don't always talk about? What did she do? She lied. Right? She lied. Because they asked her, where are those individuals, the spies? Right? Being a woman of faith, as we know the Bible chronicles, chronicles her too, <coughs> she's supposed to say, they're right there <laughs> in the attic. But she says, no. She let them escape. Right? So she lied. She's deceptive. We always think about, why would God let somebody like her be chronicled in the Faith Hall of Fame, knowing that she was imperfect. Abraham, on the other hand, was righteous. He was a good guy. He deserves to be in the Faith Hall of Fame. But her? And it was God's wisdom that said, in spite of what she did, there are some people that teach, well, she did because of the situation that her tyrannical leader would have put her in. You know, she was, a, she was placed in a position where she had no choice. However you want to put a spin on that, I'm going to leave that up to you and the Holy Spirit. But I believe this, because she came to embrace in the God of Israel. And that's all God required. She had faith, but then she didn't only have faith, but she put action to her faith. And that's where a lot of Christians fail. God has called us. If God can use Rahab, then God can use you. It's not about just believing that God of Israel. It's not about just believing in God Almighty. It's about putting into action those things that you have come to believe in. And that's what faith and works is all about. They work in partnership with each other. So after a while, they literally entwine with one another. Amen? I want to share this. This is a story about a chaplain. Once a chaplain, I'm going to close with this. Once a chaplain walked up to a wounded soldier who had been lying on the dirt sometime without any tre anyone treating his wounds. The chaplain asked, would you like me to read to you from the Bible? No, came the angry reply. Is there anything else I can do for you? The chaplain asked. I'm thirsty, the soldier said. The chaplain gave him a drink from his canteen. Anything else? He asked, I'm cold, came the reply. The chaplain took off his coat and spread it over the soldier. Anything else? Again, asked the chaplain. My head is uncomfortable, was the reply. The chaplain took off his cap and arranged it under the soldier's head. The chaplain asked again, anything else? The soldier looked up at him and tears came to his eyes as he said, I think now I would like to, for you to read to me from the Bible. First, love me and then witness to me is the theme of that. And that's all God has asked us to do, to love the people that are unlovable and then witness to them. Yeah, as we're going through this series of, of faith lived out, we don't want to be Christians that belong to a church that does nothing. We don't want to be Christians that have no loving heart and won't extend what Jesus Christ so freely gave us. His unconditional love, His grace, His salvation. We have a God that provides all of our needs according to His riches and glory. And there are people out there that don't know who this God is. 
We are blessed abundantly, immeasurably more than we could ever ask. And there are people out there that don't know who this God is. And because of his great love, we as people should be willing to share what God has so richly given us. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 10 says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let's pray.